We're very pleased to have uh, two scholars joining us today. Our first presenter who will be focusing on deference at the state level is Professor Melissa Werish of the Drake University Law School. Uh, Professor Werish uh, specializes in environmental law, legal writing, appellate advocacy, and ethics. Uh, in a, is published in a wide variety of areas. Of most interest to us today, uh, she recently wrote an article along with Aaron Aronson entitled Rectifying Renda, Amending the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act to Remove the Legal Fiction of Legislative Delegation of Interpretive Authority, which was published in the Drake Law Review. Prior to her academic career, Professor Warish was in private practice in Ohio, and she's a graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law and Wake Forest University for undergraduate. After Professor Warish's presentation, uh, Adam White will be joining us to talk about federal deference. Adam is the director of the Center for the Study of the Administrative State and an adjunct professor of law at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. He's also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. He was recently appointed to the Administrative Conference of the United States, a federal advisory board focused on improving federal agencies' practices, and has been active with a number of uh, legal organizations, including the American Bar Association's Administrative Law Section. Prior uh, to his current roles, Adam White was also in private practice in Washington, D.C., and he clerked for Judge Sentel on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Adam is a graduate of Harvard Law School uh, and did his undergraduate work at the University of Iowa. So we're delighted to have an Iowan back with us today as well. Uh, so with no further ado, I will turn things over now to Professor Warish uh, to talk about deference at the state level in Iowa. Okay, um, I'm assuming you guys can hear me and if you can't, I'll see something on the screen that shows me that you can't. Um, I wanna get right to this. I am going to begin with a brief overview of deference doctrine, which is actually sort of rooted in the federal cases. I don't want to spend much time here as that's the focus of Adam's remarks. Um, but the federal case law does provide a foundation for some of the criticisms of deference doctrine, which I think will be relevant to our um, focus on Iowa today. We are going to turn to Iowa's approach. And while this webinar was touted as the future of judicial deference, um, my crystal ball is not really working. I'm going to address what I think is the current state and a recommended approach for streamlining uh, the Iowa court's analysis of the deference step. Um, so a quick overview of judicial deference at the federal level. Um, Skidmore was really recognized as one of the United States Supreme Court's first cases to articulate a framework for determining whether an agency interpretation of law should be afforded deference. Uh, the Skidmore Court noted that it had deferred in the past to agency determinations and that the decision to do so should turn on several factors, um, including the thoroughness evident in the agency's consideration, the validity, validity of its reasoning, its consistency with earlier and later pronouncements, um, and all of those factors which give it the power to persuade is lacking the power to control. Um, I have that on the screen, uh, factors which give it the power to persuade if lacking the power to control. This is an idea I want to sort of return to. Uh, judicial deference has been criticized in the context of separation of powers. So this idea of control, I think, is important, as is this idea of persuasion. Um, then the Chevron court uh, stepped in and issued what's typically deemed a two-part inquiry, although that has actually been uh, questioned. Under that inquiry the, inquiry, the court first asks if Congress has spoken on an issue. If so, the inquiry ends. If the statute is silent or ambiguous, um, the agency interpretation is um, determined under a permissible construction sort of sta standard. Uh, this is deemed a stronger form of deference than Skidmore um, and I think what happened in Chevron is what really we want to focus on here today. Um, deference is warranted not only where Congress specifically calls for regulatory elaboration, but also where Congress implicitly delegates interpretive power through the combination of statutory ambiguity and administrative responsibility. 
Um, and I think this is where things start to get complicated when we start looking for these implicit delegations of interpretive authority. Um, what was not at issue in Chevron uh, was the type of deference that should apply to agency determinations that had been rendered through more informal processes. Um, these were the issues that the Christensen and Mead courts um, looked at, and it appears that where the agency determination uh, has been rendered under a more informal processy, process, we're going to go back to sort of a, a Skidmore, less um, compelling type of deference. The big takeaway here is that Chevron seemed to really introduce this obligation of the court to try to read into statutory ambiguity and or silence some kind of intention of the legislature to delegate interpretive authority. And to my mind, this is the biggest problem with the deference inquiry. Um, we're gonna come back to this, but what I would emphasize is that I support the practical considerations for giving weight to an agency interpretation, like agency expertise and formality of decision-making, but I don't think it's an efficient or effective use of the court's time to be looking for evidence to impute an intention of the legislature to delegate interpretive authority. So let's look at some of the criticisms. Um, deference to agency interpretation have been explained by normative considerations, such as agency expertise or political accountability. In other words, deference is deemed warranted because agencies possess some special expertise in interpreting terms within their domain. Um, some scholars have also asserted that deference to agency determinations is warranted because of the political accountability of agencies, making their determinations subject to accountability for political decisions regarding ambiguous statutory terms. Um, I think that's a questionable justification in the state context. Um, notwithstanding, deference to agency determinations is also subject to a wide variety of criticisms, not the least of which involves confusion emanating from the various permutations of deference jurisprudence at the federal level. And the quote you see here is sort of representative calling Chevron a siren song that alters the administrative state. Um, I wanna go through just a few concrete examples of what I think are legitimate criticisms, but I wanna end up with a criticism that you see reflected at the end of this quote, and that is the fiction of legislative intent. So focusing on the issue of congressional intent, critics dismiss as a fiction the idea that statutory ambiguity necessarily reflects congressional intent for administrative agencies to fill in the gaps. So another criticism, how much deference, right? Um, how much deference to give an agency interpretation? Is this a feather or an elephant on the scale? We're gonna see how the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act articulates the standard of review that's applicable to agency interpretations that are entitled to deference, but on reviewing the Iowa cases, I'm not sure whether we're gonna land on the elephant or the feather. Um, I have seen some studies that suggest that this is not as variable as I am suggesting. So for example, in a 1999 study of 200 cases under the Individuals with Disability Act, uh, researchers concluded that there was a strong correlation between the degree of deference articulated by the reviewing court and result. In other words, when a high degree of deference was articulated, the result was likely affirmed, and where no deference was warranted, more change occurred. I'm not sure we're going to see the same pattern here in Iowa. Uh, Chevron has been heavily criticized for eroding separation of powers. And it's been argued that Chevron not only infringes on the judiciary's power to interpret the law, but that it also transfers to administrative agencies the power to make law through their interpretations of broadly worded congressional statutes. You know, supporters of Chevron claim that efficient functioning of the administrative state demands such powers. Opponents worry that democratic principles are being undermined. Um, I think that the approach I'm gonna suggest for Iowa might strike a bit of balance on these competing concerns. Uh, another criticism involves an inquiry into what really is going on. What does it mean to defer to someone or something? Um, is it to allow another entity to make the determination or to agree to follow another entity's determination? Here the question becomes whether we're substituting the agency's determination or whether it really means we're giving it weight. 
And I actually think this is a distinction with a difference, especially in this context, because we're trying to articulate the framework for judicial decision making. Um, judges and advocates alike should understand what's actually going on. And in this respect, the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act is helpful in articulating the standard of review applicable to agency interpretations for which the court has concluded warrant deference. Uh, we'll come back to this, but a few more criticisms. Um, another criticism is that the search for a legislative intent to delegate interpretive authority is just smoke and mirrors. You know, one scholar noted, quote, the law governing judicial deference to agency statutory constructions is a ghastly brew of improbable fictions and proceduralisms. You know, we know that Congress is capable of explicitly delegating interpretive authority, so why do we need to stray from express delegation to some implicit delegation theory? I'm going to assert that particularly in the state context, we shouldn't be looking for some implicit or imputed delegation, which has been characterized as a legal fiction, and that we should ex instead rely on express delegation. Uh, so for example, under both RENDA, the Iowa version of Chevron and Chevron, the court looks for statutory ambiguity and or silence as some indication that Congress intends to delegate interpretive authority to an agency. You know, I think there's little reason to believe that ambiguity signals congressional intent to delegate interpretive authority to an administering agency and not to the reviewing court. I find this quote, once sort of fully digested, to actually be really instructive. Um, the legal fiction of imputed delegation arises not because the court does not actually inquire into whether Congress intended to delegate interpretive authority Rather, it arises because the court does not inquire into whether Congress actually intended to delegate interpretive authority. I think I can unpackage that for you. Rather than truly looking for evidence of what the legislature actually intended, courts are looking for evidence to impute an intention to the legislature. And while this may explain what the court's doing, it doesn't necessarily justify why the court's doing it or whether the court should be doing it. So let's turn to the Iowa model for judicial deference, which is codified in the Iowa Code. Looking first at what the court is obligated and or prohibited from doing, Iowa Code Section 17A.1911 notes under A that the court shall not give deference to an agency's determination of the extent of its own authority. Well, that makes sense. The agency hasn't been delegated authority to determine the extent of its own authority, and a court shouldn't defer to such a self-interested interpretation. Under subsection B, the court should not give deference to agency determinations in circumstances in which the court has not found the interpretations to be vested in the agency's discretion. Well, that also makes sense because absent a delegation of authority, the court should be issuing its own interpretation. It's under C, where the court shall give deference to the agency on matters in which the agency has been vested with authority. Okay, so where vested with authority, we give deference. What kind of deference? That brings us to Iowa Code Section 17A.1910. Uh, under C, where the agency has not been clearly vested with authority, the standard of review is erroneous, right? Not a high deference standard. However, where the interpretation has clearly been vested by a provision of law, the applicable standard of review is irrational, illogical, or wholly unjustifiable, a much higher deference standard. But I wanna focus in on the language that I've emphasized the code section refers to matters that have or have not been clearly vested. It doesn't refer to matters that were explicitly vested. Uh, Professor Arthur Bonfield of the University of Iowa Law School wrote the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act and explained that clearly is a much less restrictive threshold than explicitly. So how is a court to determine when an agency has been clearly vested with interpretive authority. Um, this was Bonfield's explanation of how a court should make this determination, and this language does appear in the Iowa case law. 
In order to determine that an agency has been clearly vested with interpreted authority, a court has to have a firm conviction from reviewing the price, precise language of the statute, its context, the purpose of the statute, and the practical considerations involved that the legislature actually intended or would have intended had it thought about the question to delegate to the agency interpretive authority. The emphasis is mine and it underscores that the court isn't really looking for evidence of an intention to delegate but for evidence to impute an intention to delegate. You know, in situations where the legislature might have if it had considered the issue. And this brings us to the RENDA framework, which is sort of the Iowa version of Chevron, um, but interesting and unique in insofar as it focuses in on the particular terms at issue. So in other words, when Iowa when an Iowa court is trying to determine whether to grant deference to an agency determination, it considers the precise terms at issue to determine whether the agency has been clearly vested interpretive authority with respect to those terms, right? And where does that evidence come from? Miranda, an examination of specific statutory language and the special expertise of the agency. Other evidence is articulated in some of the post-RENDA cases. So for example, in Sherwin-Williams, the court noted that rulemaking authority, uh, decision-making or, uh, or enforcement authority that requires the agency to interpret the statutory language and the agency's expertise might influence the court's determination on whether it's been clearly vested with interpretive authority. Um, these types of institutional competence considerations makes sense to me in terms of giving weight to the agency interpretation, right? Agency expertise should be influential, but they make less sense to me when viewed as evidence that the leg legislature intended to delegate the interpretive authority. Um, we get more guidance from Next Era Energy um, in which the court noted that certain guidelines have emerged to help the court determine when the legislature clearly, clearly vested interpretive authority. So you see that when the statutory provision being interpreted is a substantive term within the sub special expertise of the agency, um, that weighs in favor of a finding that the agency has been vested with the authority to interpret. In contrast, when a term has independent legal definition that's not uniquely within the subject matter expertise of the agency, generally conclude the agency has not been vested with interpretive authority. Again, those normative considerations focusing back on the expertise of the agency. Um, the article that I wrote with my student Erin Aronson um, was published in 2015 and we addressed cases that were post renda as of the date of publication and at that point we were dealing with about 20 cases. Um, in 19 of those, no deference was deemed um, warranted with respect to the agency interpretation. I did update the research and it looks like there are about 34 Iowa Supreme Court cases. Um, and I want to focus on two that arguably grant deference to the agency interpretation. Most of the cases conclude that no deference is warranted with respect to the terms at issue. Um, primarily because the court concludes that um, the terms are not particularly complex or they don't have unique agency specific meaning. However, in one case, Evercom Systems Inc. was a 2011 case. The court had to consider whether to give deference to the Iowa Utilities Board's interpretation of the term unauthorized change in service and its definition of cramming. Uh, the court emphasized that the fact that an agency has been granted rulemaking authority does not give the agency the, the authority to interpret all statutory language, but in this case the court did conclude that the rulemaking requirement in the enabling legislation evidenced a clear legislative intent to vest in the utility, utilities board um, authority to interpret, interpret authorized change in service provisions. So notwithstanding the fact that the court concluded that the agency had the authority to interpret, it did overturn the determination under the irrational, illogical, or wholly unjustifiable standard of review 
from 17A.19. Um, another case, a 2017 case, Brocky, involved a dispute over the Department of Natural Resources Quarantine Authority. Um, in that case, the Iowa Supreme Court determined the DNR was entitled to deference with respect to quarantine authority, but that its reading and application of that authority nonetheless failed the high deference, irrational, illogical, or wholly unjustifiable deferential standard of review. I think what we're seeing is generally the court's not finding um, that interpretive authority has been clearly vested, um, and therefore it's not granting deference. And in the two cases in which it did find that the agency interpretation was entitled to deference, it overturned the determination nonetheless. Um, in the cases in which no deference is warranted, um, the court upholds the agency interpretation you know, about 50% of the time. So it looks like at the state level, we're not seeing a lot of deference to agency interpretation. I want to point out, however, on occasion, a justice will disagree with the deference finding by the court. So I'll turn your attention to SZ Enterprises, the Iowa Utilities Board. Um, in this case, the court concluded that no deference was warranted, but Justice Mansfield, joined by Justice Waterman, dissented from the opinion and the assent addressed the majority assertion that the terms at issue were not complex or technical and therefore not deserving of deference. The dissent stated that the majority had, quote, missed the boat or at least stepped aboard the wrong boat, end quote. Uh, Mansfield clarified that the issue under RENDA is not whether the term itself is technical or complex, but rather whether the term appears to have a specialized meaning. Mansfield noticed, noted that the term public utility is a specialized term, and he therefore concluded that it was, quote, something that should be decided by the regulatory agency that sees such matters every day and is in a better position to assess the public interest. You can see the quote that appears on the screen, uh, noting, as I read the majority opinion, my colleagues appear to be substituting their expertise on utility regulation for that of the board. I think this dissenting position on deference is rooted in the institutional competence and expertise of the agency. Um, in another case, Next Era Energy Resources, um, the court determined that no deference was warranted for the agency interpretation, but nonetheless upheld the agency's interpretation. Um, in this case, Justice Mansfield wrote a specially concurring opinion again, focusing on the issue of deference. He concurred with a result that emphasized that the court had historically deferred to the utility board's interpretation of the complex rules it administered, and that therefore the expertise of the agency was a justification for deference. In a footnote, and you see this in the second paragraph on the screen, Mansfield observes that the majority in upholding the agency interpretation might be according it more deference than it acknowledged. And this brings me to our proposal to rectify RENDA, which would be to amend the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act to obligate the court to defer to agency interpretations only when there's an express delegation of authority in the enabling legislation. This would, of course, leave the court the ability to take into account agency expertise in its independent review of the interpretation. In other words, um, we would dispense with this search for a reason to impute an intention to delegate interpretive authority. You know, I go back to the framework that Bonfield explained, that of obligating the court to try to ascertain what the legislator, le legislature might have done if it had thought about it. Um, under a revised vision of the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act, the court would simply evaluate the enabling legislation for express delegation and finding none would then en engage in its inevitable review of the interpretation, fully free to be persuaded by agency expertise or formality of decision making. This approach maintains the reasons why we, I'm using quotey fingers here, defer, which are legitimate in many instances. Um, because of agency accountability and expertise or because of the formality of the decision-making process. 
but these reasons don't actually represent evidence that the legislature intended to grant interpretive authority to the agency. More specifically, they shouldn't be treated as evidence to impute such an intention. Rather, they should be transparently considered as persuasive as aspects of the interpretation. You know, if deference depends on legislative intent to delegate, we should do so where that intention is explicit. And in all other instances, we should drop the complicated and unnecessary analysis of whether to defer and proceed as the court must to an independent consideration of the interpretation, taking into perspective uh, these persuasive aspects. So I don't think this approach would have a significant impact on decision-making on the merits, as the court rarely finds evidence of impute imputed intention to delegate, and it does maintain the court's ability to acknowledge those persuasive aspects of an agency's inter interpretation, including expertise and formality of decision-making. The our approach really just boils down to a distinction between deference, which sort of implicates separation of powers concerns, and persuasion, which balances the efficiencies offered by the administrative state with the court's obligation to interpret the law. Um, that's all I have with respect to the state material, um, so I turn it over now to Adam. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. Um, as Sam noted in his introduction, uh, you know, even though I'm out here near Washington, D.C., where I now work, I'm, I'm a, uh, a graduate of the University of Iowa, and, and more important than that, I'm born and, and raised in Dubuque, Iowa still have a lot of family back in the area. So it's a real honor and pleasure anytime I get to come back uh, to Iowa for work. Um, and it's an honor and pleasure to be here on the phone with you all today. Now, it, it's funny, with judicial deference, it's normally such a sleepy, um, lawyerly topic. I just want to say at the outset that it, it's fascinating in recent years to see this actually become a political hot button issue um, in Washington, in Congress even, and, and in the Supreme Court. You know, Deference, Chevron deference, judicial deference really is one of those 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 sort of tedious technical legal issues. At least it was for a very long time. And, and now I find myself in congressional hearings over these issues or talking with with uh, with congressional staff. And, and it's becoming, as I'll explain in a little bit, an increasingly controversial topic in the Supreme Court. And as I'll as I'll go on to explain in a little bit. I don't expect any radical changes to come out of Congress or the court anytime soon, but I think it's important uh, that you be cognizant of some of the fault lines of the debates um, to help inform you as to where the doctrine is now and where it might head next. But for most of this, uh, most of what I'm about to tell you, it'll be real nuts and bolts just describing the doctrines because the doctrines are important. Um, they're longstanding, even though, although they, they change a little bit or they have changed in recent years. Um, so let's just start from the very beginning. Um, with the Federal Administrative Procedure Act. The federal APA is, is much less detailed in these respects than the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act. There really is only one provision in the a federal APA that, that, that alludes to this area of law and does, doesn't even mention deference by name. But in 5 U.S.C. Section 706, the federal APA says that the reviewing court in, in an administrative law action shall determine all questions of law and interpret constitutional and statutory provisions. On its face, you might wonder whether that leaves any room for deference at all. After all, the statute says the court shall determine questions of law and the court shall interpret constitutional and statutory provisions. Some point to that language as an argument for why Chevron deference is actually um, unconstitutional, I'm sorry, uh, unlawful as a matter of federal law. Um, but the fact is the courts have long applied that provision in a way that leaves great room for deference to the agency's interpretations of the law. The courts don't always uh, interpret these statutes, these regulations de novo, they tend to defer. But the ways in which they go about that defer deference actually gets a little bit complicated and nuanced. So I'll discuss you know, the two major forms of deference, of judicial deference to agency legal interpretations at the federal level. Um, one has to do with statutes, and it's the aforementioned Chevron deference. The other has to do with agency interpretations of their own regulations. Not agencies interpreting the statutes that Congress passed, but agencies interpreting the regulations that they themselves wrote. And that second form of deference is called either Seminole Rock deference or our deference, not O-U-R, 
but A-U-E-R, the name of a case, Auer v. Robbins. So I'll discuss them both, and then I'll discuss the reforms. I'll start with Chevron deference, deference of, of statutory interpretation, since we've already sort of begun with that and touched on that a little bit. While agent, well, sorry, while courts have long, long been, inter been deferring to agencies' statutory interpretations, uh, especially through the, the Skidmore Doctrine that Melissa referred to earlier, in 1984 there was a, a sea change in the, the, the way that these things were thought about. I don't think the Supreme Court realized it was creating such a landmark case when it decided it in 1984, but the Chevron case, Chevron versus National Resources Defense Council, really did create this entire new framework for deference, or at least it framed it in new terms uh, that we're still grappling with today. Back in 1984 or thereabouts, the big concern in the Supreme Court was that the federal courts, um, especially the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, were micromanaging agencies far more aggressively than Congress ever had intended. The idea was that so many federal regulatory statutes are written in very broad terms, they leave a lot of discretion to the agencies to craft policy and the public interest. Um, but the courts, especially the D.C. Circuit, were, were, were micromanaging the agencies. And, and to borrow Justice Mansfield's words, um, uh, I think his, his approach in the, in the case that Melissa mentioned really does echo the approach of the Supreme Court in, in, um, in, in the 1980s. The concern was that, was that the lower courts were substituting their own expertise for the better expertise of the expert agencies that, that, that work in these issues all the time. So in Chevron in 1984, the Supreme Court tried to create more space for agency discretion in a significant case involving the Clean Air Act. I mean, in, in a nutshell, um, the basic issue in the case was this. For a long time uh, in administering the Clean Air Act, the EPA had regulated pollution from power plants, manufacturing plants, other things we call stationary sources. They regulated the pollution coming out of each individual smokestack, we'll say. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration, the EPA, thought it might be more efficient to actually regulate it at a bit higher level of generality, to create a bubble over every power plant, no matter how many smokestacks were involved in it, and just require the agency to, to reduce overall aggregate emissions from all the smokestacks, um, rather than trying to regulate each individual one. Um, this became, it wasn't just a policy fight, it was also a fight over statutory interpretation because the agencies, sorry about that, because uh, the agency was in effect reinterpreting, its, reinterpreting the statutory term for what a source, a major source of pollution was. And so there's a question over whether the EPA could reinterpret the statute this way. The Supreme Court in the Chevron case erected the, the now t famous two-step framework for deference. Uh, saying the way to go about these sorts of questions is this. In the first step, the court should ask, did Congress speak directly and unambiguously to the question at hand? We often say, is the statute unambiguous? If the statute clearly answers the question at hand, then the court should just apply the statute without any deference to the agency. But if the statute is not clear, if the statute is ambiguous, if Congress didn't have a precise intent on the question at hand, then the court should defer to the agency's interpretation of the statute, as long as that interpretation is reasonable. So again, in step one of Chevron, the court will ask, is the statute unambiguous? Did Congress have a clear intent on the issue? If so, that's the end of the inquiry. If Congress didn't have a precise intent on the issue, if Congress didn't write an unambiguous statute in this respect, then in step two, the courts say, well, we'll defer to the agency's interpretation as long as it's reasonable. Let me just unpack that a little bit. The first step, like I said, the court used a few different uh, phrases to characterize what it was doing. It asked, did Congress have a precise intent? Did Congress speak clearly to the issue? Did Congress write an unambiguous statute? But what the court said in a footnote, in the opinion, a very important footnote, they said, we'll use the traditional tools of statutory construction to decide whether Congress had a specific intent in mind. And so when they say the traditional tools of statutory construction, what they mean is the court should go about interpreting the law just as it interprets the law in any other case. Now, what does that mean? It means, well, you look at the plain language of the statute, 
It might mean you apply canons of construction and rules of interpretation that are normally applied in interpreting the law. It might involve legislative history. It might involve a review of legislative purpose. But all of those things tend to get roped in at step one, which is just this basic statutory analysis of whether the statute at hand uh, clearly speaks to the issue uh, before the court. Um, but even that can get a little bit complicated. Let me offer you an example. In 2005, the D.C. Circuit heard a case called American Bar Association versus FTC, where the Federal Trade Commission had asserted jurisdiction over lawyers. They wanted to regulate lawyers under an aspect of, of um, federal financial law that gave the FTC the power to regulate um, financial institutions. And while you wouldn't normally think of a lawyer as a financial institution, the FTC had an argument that, that under the statute, the term was defined pretty broadly. It, 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 it covered not just banks and other things you normally think of as financial institutions, but it also covered uh, entities that regularly engage in certain financial transactions. And the FTC concluded, well, that includes lawyers when lawyers are involved in these financial transactions. But the D.C. Circuit in that case, in ABA versus FTC, said, no, you have to think a little bit harder than that about it at the first step of Chevron. In this case, the FTC was asserting power over lawyers in a way it never had done before, which raised all sorts of federalism issues since lawyers are traditionally regulated at the state level, not at the federal level. And so the, the D.C. Circuit in that case said, at Chevron step one, you really do need to take seriously things like federalism and other basic rules or canons of construction, rules of constitutional avoidance, to ensure that your statutory interpretation makes sense um, and, and, and makes sense in light of these broader principles of legal interpretation, including, including principles of federalism. So that's just one example where in step one, applying the traditional tools of statutory construction to figure out whether a statute has a specific meaning, it's not just looking at the words on the page in their general sense. It really is doing the lawyer's work of using all the tools you have at hand to figure out what a legal text means. So that's step one of Chevron. Step two of Chevron can get a little complicated too. Um, even though the basic question is, is pretty straightforward, is the agency's interpretation of the statute a reasonable one? And, and that often and overwhelmingly actually favors the agency. There are cases in which the courts will push back and say the agency's interpretation simply is not reasonable. Let me offer you uh, another recent example. In uh, 2014, the Supreme Court heard a case called Utility Air Regulatory Group versus EPA. It was a challenge to the, um, the sort of second round of the Obama administration's big greenhouse gas regulations. The EPA had issued uh, a, a suite of of regulations that would put a lot of permitting and approval requirements on companies that were emitting greenhouse gases. And the Supreme Court, by and large, struck the program down, saying that the agency's interpretation of the Clean Air Act was unreasonable, in large part because it was such a, a, an unprecedented assertion of newfound authority without any real limiting principle. The Supreme Court looked at that and said, even though the statute is, is ambiguous, this isn't a Chevron step one case, even in the usually deferential Chevron step two, we still need to guard against um, unlimited assertions of power, newfound power by an agency that aren't clearly written into the statute. And so there the Supreme Court struck down the EPA's interpretation of the Clean Air Act because it thought the agency's approach was simply unreasonable, impractical, impracticable, and unlimited. So in step one, again, in Chevron, the question is, is the statute unambiguous? And we, we go about that, that, that analysis by applying the traditional tools of statutory interpretation. In step two of Chevron, is the agency's interpretation of, a, of an ambiguous statute reasonable? Um, the court is looking for a number of things, uh, oftentimes looking for red flags that the agency has, has, has gone beyond even the generous limits of a statute. What's the point of all that? What's the point of Chevron deference? Well, some of it was alluded to by Melissa in her presentation. You know, the basic premise of Chevron deference, uh, at least one of the basic premises, is the courts are saying that, that Congress, we're going to assume that Congress is delegating to the agencies rather than the courts um, the main power to interpret uh, or breathe life into these very open-ended statutes. Um, and, and part of that is, is democratic accountability. 
agencies, of course, you, we don't elect the heads of agencies at the federal level, but we do elect the president, and he in turn appoints these officers. And so there is some kind of democratic accountability in the agencies that is much less present in the courts. And so Chevron deference is premised upon on um, this, this notion that, that it's better to have these big policy-laden choices made by and large by, by somewhat ele- uh, accountable agency officials rather than totally unaccountable courts. So that's one, at, that's one justification for Chevron. The other, which was alluded to earlier, is just one of expertise, that it's the agencies, not the courts, that are dealing with these statutes all the time. You know, a judge on the D.C. Circuit, he hears a lot of cases, but very rarely is he delving very deeply into you know, a given statute. Um, like the Dodd-Frank financial laws, whereas an agency like the Securities and Exchange Commission, every day they're working in that statute, and they have much better expertise as to what Congress intended uh, the statute to mean, and also they have better expertise about how to go about making sure that all the parts of the statutory program hang together. So again, the basic premise of Chevron is that the Congress is delegating uh, these interpretive questions primarily to the agencies rather than the courts, in order to promote democratic accountability and to promote expertise. Now, so far, when I've talked about Chevron, I've been talking about it in terms of the famous two steps. But as Melissa alluded to earlier, there is debate over whether Chevron has more steps than just those two. And the most famous uh, step, and it's a very important one, increasingly important, is called Chevron Step Zero. And what I mean by that is before we apply Chevron at all, before we ask in step one whether the statute is unambiguous, before we ask in step two, well, the statute's ambiguous, but is is the agency's interpretation reasonable? We need to ask in step zero a basic question over whether Congress actually did delegate interpretive power to the agency rather than to the courts. In a case called United States versus Meade from 2000, the court set up this framework. They said, before we get to the Chevron analysis at all, we need to ask, Did Congress delegate to the agency the authority to make these interpretations with the force of law? And second, uh, is the agency in this particular case actually using that power to interpret things with the force of law? So as Melissa suggested earlier, um, what this means really uh, in a nutshell is that when an agency goes through a very informal process, of of interpreting the law, not notice and comment rulemaking or something more serious than that. And and, and it's not working at at the agency leadership level, but rather at the staff level, many levels down the organizational chart. If the agency is just making much more casual interpretations that aren't intended to be binding or don't come from the top of the agency, then the court might say that Chevron actually doesn't apply at all, that, that this is at Chevron step zero, we conclude that, that the court should just interpret the law for itself. Another way that this comes into play in Chevron step zero is what we call the major questions doctrine. In a recent case involving the Affordable Care Act, the Supreme Court looked at this case which involved, um, or looked at the issue which involved um, uh, the subsidy of insurance policies bought on certain um, health insurance exchanges under the Affordable Care Act. And the Supreme Court said this is such an important issue, it's so crucial to the overall working of the Affordable Care Act, that we're not going to just lightly assume that Congress wanted the agency to be the one interpreting the law rather than the courts, um, especially when the agency in question, the the Internal Revenue Service, is not a traditional health regulator. Uh, The court said in that case, this issue is so important that we, the courts, should be the ones interpreting the law on our own without any deference. So that's another way in which at Chevron step zero, the courts sometimes avoid getting to the Chevron deference issue altogether. Now, if the court decides at Chevron step zero that that Chevron shouldn't apply, well, then what standard do they apply? In in the the case I just mentioned a moment ago about the Affordable Care Act, it's called King v. Burwell, it's from 2015, the court said if Chevron doesn't apply, then we're going to review the law de novo. We're just going to interpret it for ourselves without any deference. In that earlier case I mentioned, Meade versus United States from 2000, after the Supreme Court held we're not going to apply Chevron in this case, they applied that much more uh, uh, amorphous version of deference called Skidmore deference, the one that Melissa referred to earlier, the one that says, uh, where the court famously said decades ago, that we will, we will defer to the extent uh, that the, the agency's approach 
has with it the power to persuade, if not the power to control. So in Meade, the court says, when Chevron doesn't apply, we'll apply this lesser Skidmore deference instead. In King v. Burwell, the court said, well, when Chevron doesn't apply, we'll just interpret the law de novo. That's really an open question right now over how those two lines of cases will be uh, resolved. It's an open question over what exactly, what standard you apply if Chevron doesn't apply. Now, having cruised through all of those details very briefly without giving you the benefit of, uh, of a PowerPoint presentation, I hope I haven't put you to sleep, I do want to take a step back and just look at the big picture of all this for a second. Because while Chevron has been around and reasonably stable since the mid-1980s, there have been fascinating debates within the court over how Chevron should be reformed or recalibrated. Justice Scalia was not on the Supreme Court when Chevron was decided, but from the moment he joined the court, he had been he was one of the most reliable defenders of the simple, straightforward, two-step Chevron framework. Every time the court tried to interject a new wrinkle into the Chevron framework, like creating that step zero in, in 2000, uh, Scalia over and over again would denounce the justices for complicating things. If you want a really good understanding of Scalia's view of Chevron deference, he wrote a, an article in, in the 1989 Duke Law Journal about judicial deference. And it, it's short. It's only about 12 pages. But it's maybe the clearest defense of Chevron deference that you'll ever read. He, uh, While he was saying that, you had arguments coming the other way um, from an interesting coalition. Um, Justice Breyer, uh, Justice Souter, other, other liberals on the Supreme Court, they often were the ones making Chevron deference a little bit more nuanced, a little bit more iterative in terms of, of adding extra steps. And at the same time, more recently, you've seen full-throated criticism of Chevron from conservatives like Justice Thomas, now Justice Gorsuch. So I'll get to that. When, but again, when Chevron was first created in the 80s, it was a victory for the Reagan administration um, and a setback for largely the, the judges on the D.C. Circuit, who were at the time were predominantly um, uh, or at least in the 70s coming into the 80s, predominantly Democratic appointees. So for a long time, Chevron deference was seen as, as more a conservative doctrinal tool than a liberal one. It's very interesting now to see the conservatives uh, and Republicans in Congress being the ones criticizing Chevron deference and wanting to, um, wanting to, 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 um, to rein it back in. I do want to say uh, the last big picture point about Chevron is that Chevron deference is an extremely powerful tool in the hands of the agencies. There was a fascinating academic study that came out a couple of years ago by Professor Chris Walker of Ohio State um, and, and, and a colleague, Kent Barnett from, from Alabama, um, who, who studied the way the courts apply Chevron. And they found that when the courts use Chevron deference, the courts are 25% more likely to rule for the government than they would without deference. So if the courts decide Chevron applies, that means that the, the odds of success for the government go up 25%, and the odds of success for the, um, for the challengers go down 25%. Um, and, and, and it gets much more nuanced and intricate than that when you start analyzing how, the courts are, how different courts are applying different steps of Chevron. But this isn't just one of those doctrines where it's a lot of talk without any real substantive ramifications. Chevron deference, when it applies, is an extremely powerful tool for the agencies. Now, all of that, all of Chevron deference, is about agencies interpreting the laws, the statutes that Congress passed. Um, in addition to all of that, is, is, I want to say very briefly, this other form of deference that I alluded to earlier called seminal rock deference or our deference, A-U-E-R. This is the deference that applies when the regulators are interpreting the regulations that they themselves wrote. They're not interpreting Congress's statutes, they're interpreting their own regulations. In this context, the courts are even more deferential. The basic doctrine of Seminole Rock deference is, is, um, is that the agency's interpretation of its own regulation should get controlling deference from the court so long as the agency's interpretation isn't clearly erroneous or inconsistent with the regulation. Clearly erroneous, a very, very tough standard for a challenger to meet. I mean, the basic premise of this is who would know better than the agency what the agency means in its own regulation? 
That's the basic premise of seminal rock deference. And it's, it's extremely powerful, whereas with Chevron deference, um, the courts in step zero um, will look to the process that the agency went through in interpreting a statute. In seminal rock deference, the courts will often interpret to an, or sorry, defer to an agency's interpretation of its own regulation. When the agency comes up with that interpretation for the first time in a legal brief, the agency doesn't have to do all this up front. It can do it after the fact, although um, if the court starts to suspect that the agency is, is coming up with an ex post facto rationalization for something, that it's trying to game the system, then it won't get this, this, this utmost deference. But normally, uh, the courts will be extremely deferential to an agency's interpretation of its own regulation. But that, too, is beginning to change. Around 2010, Justice Scalia began to uh, raise some serious doubts about the propriety of this doctrine. In a case called Talk America versus Michigan Bell from 2010, Scalia um, published a very surprising dissent, um, surprising because it was a total reversal for him on our deference, seminal rock deference, in a way that nobody expected. Justice Scalia took a step back and said that actually deferring to an agency's interpretation of its own regulation raises profound problems under the separation of powers. The basic idea of separation of powers is that one body of government writes the law and then another body of government interprets the law. And that, as, as the philosopher Montesquieu had said centuries ago, the combination of the law writing and law interpreting powers in the same set of hands threatens to become the definition of tyranny. You can't have the same person writing the law and then interpreting it. So Scalia, beginning in 2010, started to call on the Supreme Court to totally abandon deference to an agency's interpretation of its own regulations. Scalia began to argue that the courts actually need to do all of that interpretation themselves without any deference to the agencies. And since he originally raised that concern in 2010, you've seen Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, Chief Justice Roberts, all to varying degrees adopt that criticism. Justice Thomas especially, he's been the most forceful critic of seminal rock deference and now Chevron deference. He believes that all of it is a total abdication of the judicial duty, um, in, in Chief Justice Marshall's famous words in Marbury versus Madison, to say what the law is. So Justice Thomas and Justice, now Justice Gorsuch and others are, have been arguing for significant refer, reform or maybe total abandonment of judicial deference to agency legal interpretations, whether Chevron or Seminole Rock. Um, so again, that's the one basic uh, threat to Chevron deference now, our deference, is that, that it's an abdication of judicial duty. The other challenge to these forms of deference is the one I alluded to at the outset, that the Administrative Procedure Act directs the courts to interpret the law. And the argument is that, that Chevron deference and Seminole Rock, or our deference, are fundamentally incompatible with that basic legislative command that agencies, or sorry, that courts interpret the law rather than agencies. So the first major battleground we have right now over these issues is, is in the courts, especially the Supreme Court with Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch. I frankly doubt that the Supreme Court will overturn Chevron deference altogether, but I think we will continue to see the court poke holes in Chevron um, or make more exceptions to Chevron deference in the way that the court did in the King v. Bur Burwell Affordable Care Act case or the Mead case. I think we'll see more cases like that um, quite frankly, if, if, um, if, if Hillary Clinton had won the last presidential election um, and the FCC um, had continued its net neutrality policy, um, that case probably would have been the next big Chevron case. I was heavily involved in litigation of that case, and we had, my, my, my clients and I had, had filed the main briefs on the Chevron issues. We really expected that case and, and, and litigation over the Clean Power Plan to become the new Chevron cases. But I think those issues are probably a little bit on hold now that those major rulemakings are off the table. But at the same time, we have calls in Congress to get rid of Chevron deference. Again, it's fascinating to see Congress delve into such a technical issue. Um, but the main legislation you ought to watch for is called the Separation of Powers Restoration Act. It's a law that's been passed by the House as a part of a suite of regulatory reform bills um, by which Congress would prohibit the, agent, the courts from deferring at all. It would specifically direct courts to not defer 
to agency interpretations of law. I don't expect that will get passed anytime soon because I don't expect Congress to pass anything anytime soon on, on any subject. But it is interesting to see the issue get steam and pick up steam in Congress, and it's not beyond the realm of possibility that in 10 or 15 years Congress could outlaw Chevron deference and Seminole Rock deference. So with, let me leave it at that for now. If anybody has any questions, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. If anyone has questions, you can use your chat box on your screen to send questions, and the presenters are able to see those, I believe. Uh, so we do have a couple minutes available if there are any questions. While people are thinking of questions, let me just offer a couple of practice points on, on dealing with these issues at the federal level. Uh, first, with Chevron deference, if you find yourself defending um, agency action, um, or federal agency action, the way to win the Chevron is you first you, you try to show that the statute clearly supports the agency's position so that deference is unnecessary. But then you can very quickly pivot to the argument that the statute is ambiguous and the agency's position is reasonable. Most federal regulatory statutes are ambiguous. And once the agency can get the, 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 the debate moved into that frame, that it's an ambiguous statute, the agency will win overwhelmingly. It's very, it's, it, it's, it's much more rare for the agency to lose at Chevron step two, which means as somebody challenging um, federal agency action, um, you really need to show that the statute is, is, ambi is unambiguous. That the statute can mean one and only one thing and not the thing that the agency says it means. That really is your main hope in a Chevron case. 